Rica. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Hello. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> nice to see you too. Like this is recorded. That's. Isn't everything recorded all the time? <laughs> Pretty much. Uh, not that we can get at it, but so um, this is a um, somewhat misleading title, or uh, a appropriate title for work that is in very early and preliminary form. Um, and so I'll, uh, this will be be front loaded. We'll talk mostly about context, and I hope that the context is useful for, uh, for you in thinking about the sorts of uh, security controls and privacy controls and applications in which you're going to put them. Um, because our, our, our goal is to, uh, using an empirical case, to look at different uh, uses of data and match them to different technical controls. Um, this is collaborative work. Um, direct co-conspirators include uh, my uh, low, long time co-conspirator at the Census Bureau uh, and two of my students at various places. Um, most of what I will talk about, because it is all context, is actually based on previously published work. A lot of that has been with um, these project collaborators and other members of the Harvard University Privacy Tools Group. And this and some of the, the background work is supported in part by the Sloan Foundation, uh, the disclaimer. Uh, if, you, if you like anything, as I said, it's all shared with my collaborators and co-conspirators. If anything I say is stupid or wrong or you don't like it, it's entirely my fault. Um, because they, nobody approved these slides, nor did MIT, nor Sloan, nor any other organization. Um, and so unless it was written down and published with their names on it, it's, it's my fault. Uh, and for the things that were written down and published with mutual names on it, that's, um, and you can pretty much assume that if you see a real figure or table here or anything that looks like it, it was drawn from one of these things. So what's the broader context of use and risk for government information? Um, some previous work. We tend to think about the direct decisions, the official decision in communication and the trade-off between the social value of setting the, um, setting the, the apportionment right um, versus revealing information about individuals, the harms of that information versus that main social decision. But there are two other types of functions of government information that are also very important um, that may suggest other modes of access. And these include research, that broader, the broader social benefit from research and business uses, and public transparency and accountability understanding how the information was, was produced, being able to, to replicate, uh, to verify. Um, and the harm of information, the, the threats from information, depends on, um, it's also, is also contextual, and we've been thinking talking a lot about uh, limiting access to information and different ways in which that can be limited. And the, the harm from information also depends on uh, the sensitivity of the information, which we characterize as a combined threat and vulnerability analysis. Uh, and you, you can see this in, this is an illustration of um, from the, uh, the Berkeley Law and Technology Journal paper cited earlier of this um, trade-off between, uh, of the relationship between identifiability, which we, we 
characterized as rough, some rough measure of how much you can learn about an individual because they participated in this, this data collection. And what, would, what harm might you expect, sensitivity? What harm could you expect from having that data released in the wild? Yeah. Um, and that information be um, some adversary learning from that about an individual and taking some use of it. Um, so if the, the, the risk is very small, we might not have much protection at all. Say, and uh, here we're not, I'm not talking about the, the uh, and sensitivity, sensitivity is not necessarily one, mapped one to one with a particular type of attribute. This requires a more you know, detailed analysis. But if, if you, an information release might have, has a low probability of downstream harm, then you might just release it under consent. Or, um, or if you can manage the, the risk of someone learning from that uh, through some formal protection mechanism, you could also release with lighter protections even if the, the risk is higher. And so when we're thinking about how to make data available, we have to consider not just, we have to consider what the objective of the use is, uh, what the, what the mode, not just the, the mode of analysis, but what the objective of the use is, um, how much can be learned from data and how that's controlled, and what the, the threats are from the data release. Uh, and we, this can be, um, the threat surface can be changed by uh, changes in data collection in the environment. Um, and this is from, um, 2018 paper cited. Uh, consider, you know, a one-time data collection. If you're a, a weather app that collects your um, collects your information for um, at registration, okay, collects your, your default location at registration. Um, the risk of identifying you from just that, that data point are fairly small. But we know as we repeatedly measure the same unit over time, that we can, uh, that behavioral fingerprints emerge. So if you can see a person um, or observe what you know is, is an individual, even if you don't know who that individual is, and you can make repeated measurements of their behavior, especially in space and time, you're more likely to, to be able to compute some sort of uh, behavioral fingerprint on them that allows you to connect that pattern of behavior to another, to, to a record in another database. And so their identifiability, potential for identifiability goes up and the risk goes up even if you're not measuring additional information. If you were to, to increase uh, this data collection so that instead of say checking, having the weather app check once a day um, for your, your location, it monitored it every, um, every second, maybe continuously, every tenth of a second. Um, that may reveal different, that, that level of information actually may reveal different patterns of information. It may allow you to make inferences about different patterns of behavior. For example, how often does somebody go to the gym? Where are they at a particular time? How, what's their walking speed? Which might be relevant to health. And so that expands the, the set of inferences that you could make and pushes risks out to the, to the right, as well as going up if, as, you, as you increase the. And so these are some examples of risk factors that are related to big data in a temporal sense. We've done other, other risk factors, but we were looking for 
bullet. And what happens with time factors? Um, when you, when, when the, the, the data you collect is um, older, or rather when there's an increased time between day, time of data collection and release of a computation on that data. The individual's characteristics might have changed during that time. So there may be some decrease in the ability to, to match that to available, um, e available external data. Maybe reduces the um, identifiability. Um, as time goes on, the, the number of of purposes for that, unanticipated purposes for that data might increase. We learn different things that different sorts of inferences, at least this has been the history in recent time, of, that we could make from particular data collections. And so I think that the, the number of threats, we didn't, for, for example, um, I when uh, ran a, uh, a, an archive for qualitative social science. And we have videos of um, people talking to each other. Um, and for, for years, people would use only the transcripts because that was all they, right? They wouldn't go back to the videos because that was essentially the information that they understood to be in the data and that was readily accessible, even though we had the videos. Um, and, but o over time, oh, we realized that um, you could, you know, through voice tremors, you could detect disease indicators. You could detect cognition. You might be able to pick up pulse rate from video. You, so that there are, are many more signals, many more inferences that we can extract and, and use than we expected. Um, and at, after, after some amount of time, um, people die. And so they're not vulnerable to the direct information harm of, of somebody uh, fine. So, these different risks of age of the data, how, what period, which is this sort of span of human behaviors that you're able to uh, make inferences about. If you collect data over, you know, frequently and over a long enough time, you may be able to make inferences about domains that emerge at different time scales. Business behavior might be seasonal, seasonal at the yearly level. Um, some human behavior emerges at the daily level. Some emerges over a, a much shorter time scale. Um, and the, the frequency of the data collection affects both your identifiability and, and some of the inferences you can make. So if we're thinking, so, so to match uses and harms, we have to think both about the, uh, these characteristics of harms not only the identifiability, but what are the, the risk factors for threats and vulnerabilities that create sensitivity. Um, and we've talked a lot about uh, inferential controls, but there's a whole set of controls in which this, these inferential controls are embedded. Procedural, economic, educational, legal, technical. This is a... Uh, no laser pointer button on this? No. Oh, there is. Oh, here it is. What? The red arrow. The red arrow, yeah. Okay, it was just faint. It's, a, it's an invisible laser, laser pointer. Um, this section is, is an example from a larger, a larger catalog of, of things we put together. Um, and each of these can be applied at different sequence uh, in the data curation process. Some of these are, are ap applicable at multiple stages. You could choose to apply them at collection, uh, at release, after the fact. For technical controls, we have uh, both from the uh, technical and, and, and somewhat from the legal point of view, started to divide controls into what their you know, to broad areas of purpose. Um, Controls on computation, and controls on computation include model servers. They restrict the, the types of queries you could make on the data, but not directly anything else. Um, 
you can only make this query or answer this specific computation. And emerging controls are things like functional encryption, homomorphic encryption, um, public lecture, which don't, don't restrict the, the computations but add some pro property to those computations that they're non-refutable or there's a record, permanent record of them. Um, we've talked a lot about differential privacy, which is uh, agnostic to the computation but, but limits how you can learn from those computations about the observed inference, uh, observed unit. It's control and inference. Uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of legal controls are about neither of these, but controls on purpose, which is the domain of human activity to which the inferences are applied. You can use this for research, but not for credit reporting purposes. It doesn't matter if you, yeah, if you made a particular computation or you learned about an individual, it may be barred. Um, and the, you know, the GDPR has limits purposes on, on almost all, all data to some extent. Um, so one of the, um, one of the, the preliminary conclusions we do is mapping some of these risks, highlight these emerging risks to different approaches. And um, there are a range of approaches in which um, probably some level of human control, secure data enclave, um, formal, formal oversight is going to be required because the risk from high dimensional, high, high frequency data is not um, manageable with adequate utility guarantees. So, Michael, yeah. do you see that like for the higher risk, yeah. uh, people are going to drop differential privacy and, and do something else, or is it like? I think there are two. Uh, there are going to be two two uh, reasons where you that two things that might might guide your um, choice of control. One is what, you know, what's the risk or what's the, what's, what are the characteristics of the data that create, create risk? So um, at a particular level and um, particular types of risk, differentially private analysis for high frequency, high dimensional data, don't know how to do that very well. Um, and uh, so there's no there's no reason to believe that we can we can limit it to some reasonable uh, risk and still allow any utility on the data at this point. Um, and so we might end up saying we need other mechanisms. Um, there may also be things like where where the objective is individual analytics, uh, where the, the mode of analysis or even the objective of the analysis is incompatible with the mechanism um, of, and so then you, you might also choose a different, different mechanism. Um, and so things like uh, if, you, if you want to allow data to be, yeah. um, if you want to permit surveillance and trace back to a particular person, um, multi, but but limit the types of surveillance that are that are possible or when it's used, um, something like differential privacy is not going to allow you to do that. It's designed not to, right? But you could you could envision do, doing that with personal data stores and and uh, computable policies with. Uh, doing that, but having a uh, audit log of the surveillance, act, you know, the computations that were run for surveillance, doing that and through some restricting the types of queries that be could be run through multi-party computation, but allowing those queries sometimes to, to have inferences that, that uh, yield information about a particular individual. Uh, front loaded. So this is um, to do the to start on the, the matching in particular case. We started to look at um, how are 
can we classify how government data is disseminated now? Uh, and there are actually di uh, quite a different number of modes of dissemination, from single published estimates to interactive lookups to dynamic tables and maps to public use to direct access to, to the underlying data in restricted data centers. Um, and are there traces of use of these points, either, either direct from access logs to query servers or applications to use restricted data sources? Are there traces of use from the results in published analyses where researchers describe what they use, how, what methods they ran on the data, what they linked it with, et cetera? And are there indirect indicators of use through social media mentions, et cetera? Because business uses tend not to publish a whole lot. Um, and these are the sorts of things we are uh, looking to inform. Um, what data wrangling occurs, what, where external data sources are used, where there are uh, individual uh, cleaning operations that involve inspecting individual data points. For example, for, um, for linking operations, maybe spec for typos or something like that. Um, statistical, the statistical computing approach, whether it's based on query, some queries, linear models, likelihood estimation, Bayesian estimation, other related diagnostics methods, uh, data characteristics, what unit of analysis are they aiming, aiming at, whether time dimensions and other, other structure of data that they may be merging in. Is there a network structure, spatial video? Um, and in presentation, um, are the, the analytics and results all presented at the, at the level of uh, population coefficients, model estimates and prediction, are, or are there, there are individual data points presented as part of the analysis, either as diagnostics or visualizations or the, the like. Um, and we have not, we have completed the data collection process for the most part. We have not completed the data wrangling process to any that you know, we've done topic modeling and found some different sorts of text mining approaches on some of these as well as hand coding. So I do not have any, um, any overall uh, prevalence analysis except to say we even find evidence of all of these types of uses that people are linking, that they're doing individual uh, attempting to do as low level as available to use all of these different methods um, to present individual data directly, to use them in diagnostics. Um, and so I will end with some, some conclusions or provocations about five minutes early before the discussion time, I know, um, giving us five maybe three to five more minutes for discussion. Um, and you can read them as conclusions or provocations you wish. Uh, one is that one size does not fit all. Right. Um, given the, the variety of uses and, and goals, you should anticipate that tiered access will be necessary to address the, the major uses. Um, this is important when the data, government data supports multiple objectives that relate to those uses, and these may uh, have different use characteristics, uh, and that the informational controls vary in compatibility. Um, a model server that gives you a regression estimate may be, um, may be very useful if you know you want to run that regression, um, and you are um, not, not very careful about regression diagnostics. Um, but it may be, uh, yeah, as, a, as a strong person example, too weak to protect formally because you can, if you can run an infinite number of regressions, you can extract the data and, are too, and, and too strong to prevent thoughtful use of the data because although what you are publishing is the regression coefficient, in order to perform the analysis, you need to, to do diagnosis you need to do data 
analysis of, of data for data cleaning, you need to link in data, et cetera. Um, and some, some provocations. Um, discovery research um, may require access beyond the limits of formal protections. There's a lot of research that we are not good at, at describing formally. Um, theory generation, process tracing, synthesizing novel sources of data often involves going back and forth to see how does this data correspond to the data. Um, once this is understood and it becomes a matter of a policy analysis or applied research or estimation, you may be able to then find a formal, formal method that will give you these results on a new data set with some action. But this, this process of discovering, um, and yes, there's a threat to, to validity here, um, is a different one. And research often seems to involve both. A, a, a discovery phase, a theory, and, uh, and an application phase. Uh, representative uses isn't taking one example. Um, is unlikely to, to um, uh, un un unlikely to be a good test, uh, considering multiple different uses for multiple different objectives and at levels, and the tensions between providing those um, is a lot harder than you know, pretty much any specific. Most of the specific uses we could we could probably think of a way to deal with. And um, and worst case analyses, um, this is a definitely provocation. Aren't. Um, so we see th some methods like differential privacy takes a worst case analysis to, to privacy risk and that you consider what, what's, the, what's the most you could learn from a particular information release. So what's the upper bound of the, the informational harm you could get to that individual? Um, Title 13 also takes a worst case analysis. We should not allow any, any informational risk. And, um, on the other hand, the trade-offs were uh, often in the same analysis. We're applying average case analysis to use and utility. Consider how like increasing epsilon might affect our our mean square error, but not that's not the worst case impact on the on the research or analysis or question. So it's not comparing worst cases and average cases, and, and same with with um, and we're often. Um, optimistic about operational or informational risks. Um, going from a, uh, a system where there's a, you have known people and strong legal sanctions um, to one where you have a formal, but which provides you no formal guarantees of information loss at all, to one that um, is um, formally, formally guaranteed but implemented in an automated model server. Well, there's, they could implement it wrong. There could be, you create information security vulnerabilities. It's not that there's, it's, there's a straightforward trade-off, but we tend to, um, we, most analysis don't look at all, all, sources, of, all sources of risk in, in comparing these approaches. So I, I would uh, start going backwards, going forwards. Um, consider the context of use and the particular vulnerabilities and threats that you're, you're trying to manage. Because uh, these reflect on the overall use surface. Questions, arguments, observations. Thanks. Uh, more coffee. Thank you for your questions. More coffee. Oh. Yeah. Um, so, when you talk about risk, inferential risk, actually, I wanted to mention, I mean, just raise two questions if you don't mind. So, um, do you specify, is it always understood that the risk is of re-identification or is there, is there some other kind of risk that you consider to be risk? No, uh, that at, at basic we consider the, 
uh, we talk in terms of harm, and harm is something, someone's life going worse than it would otherwise in some significant way. Right. You're not, you know, what's, what's the likelihood that because, for, because of some information release, something bad happens to that person and their, their, their life, because that information was available, is shorter or less happy, they have less income, they have less health. That's the harm you're trying to prevent. There are a number of, of, of channels for that harm, vulnerable threats, pathways that you could imagine that harm occurring. And that release of information provides, makes them more vulnerable. So we, we take, we, this is often just compacted into what is sensitivity of the data. So we think of, you know, we call all of that stuff, all of that analysis sensitivity. And then we call the, the informational risk, what you can, what, what you like, how much you likely learn the, the privacy and the overall um, balance so, sen but the sensitivity um, determination is something that happens external to your system. I mean, I'm not. This, this isn't yeah. like a challenge or anything. It's just really to try and figure out, and you'll see it kind of relates in an interesting way to what I'll talk about yeah. later. But I just wanted to establish that there wasn't some internal sense of sensitivity, but rather we established that this kind of information that if it leaks out is likely to result in real world harm that we already know about. So it's kind of externalized from right. your and, system. And we, we don't have the, you know, either the expertise or resources to go through even a sample of like the hundreds of articles that we're hand coding and do a informational sensitivity analysis, but we can say something, ge some general things about some things that it, we think increase the sensitivity of the data. Mm -hmm. right. Factors that increase either, either the, the vulnerabilities, the paths to risks, the threats to which people are exposed, and that is to specific harms, or, or the possibility that you will learn from them, learn about them, and thus some of these these harms will, will come to realization. Question from Chris, and then Chris. Yeah, just kind of following up on that, because the way you define harm, I could say, for example, that uh, based on the result of data, less resources flow to my school district and more flow to someone other, and that lowers, that, that results in lower housing prices for everyone in this district. Mm -hmm. That would seem like a harm relative to your definition, and yet it's also a societal decision that that's what we're trying to accomplish. Sure, sure, and in, in, in many, in some cases we are, uh, and I didn't go into this, like the harm, the, the harm fairness framework, which is something else, but uh, whether a decision is fair or not depends on how you distributed harms. Sometimes harms are deserved. Right? Sometimes there are, it's a good trade-off. However, if, we, uh, if there's a social benefit and we impose individual harms differentially on particular people, um, simply because of their, you know, especially people who are um, historically disadvantaged, uh, there, I, I would say there's a, there's a justice problem with that. Um, if, we, if we make errors and the errors in our decision making affect some class of people generate harms through those, those errors in classification. Uh, harm is not, harm by itself is not unethical. But in order to say, in order to say what you're protecting against, you have to, I, I, we believe that you need to measure it with reference to some outcome that affects people's lives and some measure of that, and some counterfactual of what you would have done otherwise whether it is do a computation that doesn't reveal their, you know, doesn't allow you to infer about them individually, not have collected their data in the first place, um, given them a, uh, a, a right to challenge the, the result, or then you can say whether that, that choice resulted in some harm, and then you can start to think about whether that harm is, is fair, just, reasonable, based on the, the social benefit, et cetera. 
Yeah, I guess I guess I'm struggling in the sense that so, so I, I understand. I think I understand the approach, but particularly, it seems like a particularly in the context of big data, it seems like it's challenging for two different reasons. The first yeah. is that the underlying privacy content of big data is nearly impossible to kind of upper bound, and then the ways in which the, that information can then flow to others for use is typically through, for instance, corporate channels where you really have no earthly idea how people. So think of like a data broker model, for yeah. instance. Where you have where there's an entire business model where people are um, commingling other people's data and then selling it for purposes not entirely always benign. These are typically these may th be things that you really don't see until like a news article goes out. So, for instance, the ability to sell uh, phone location information to target uh, further target victims of intimate partner violence. Um, you know, we, when we know about them, we can say, oh, cool, that's a harm. We should be worried about that. Mm -hmm. But that's just like one example of a whole multitude of different ways in which large scale information can be used to, to target people. So I guess um, it, it, seems like, right. it seems like it's a hard thing to really quantify. Um, I, I, think it, I think it is a hard thing to quantify. And so um, but that doesn't mean that you have to you, you can ignore uh, harm, sensitivity. Uh, identifiability is a hard thing to quantify in big data as well. Um, that you, you can ignore these when you're making decisions. And if you, we think that there are some characteristics that like um, retaining the data for a longer time, that we don't know what it will be used for, but we can anticipate that whatever they consented to, whatever they understood as use at time t, there's going to be a whole space of uses at time t plus 10. Yeah. So, so there are, we, can, we can anticipate that there are some risk factors that affect vulner, possible vulnerabilities, threats, identifiability, and that those increasing risk factors justify some additional form of control whether it's in terms of control at you know, data collection or giving them a, a you know, providing a, a right to, um, to see where their data is gone and a right of action on them, of legal action or, or some other, or, or, some, or, or in a, you know, an insurance fund that they can, you know, if they, they, they show reasonable evidence that they were, there was a, increased probability downstream that this affected them, that they can collect a little bit from the insurance. So there, there are all sorts of mitigating controls you could put in place. And from a sort of social design point of view, looking at what factors are increasing vulnerability, sensitivity, identifiability, what are you going, you know, what are you going to do about it? So your, your um, comment near the end that, you know, or the government data has many different um, uses was a nice reminder that in this meeting we're mainly talking about statistical agencies. But it reminded me of um, official statistics, with, um, uh, which was about police departments struggling what to do with their, with their data as part of you know, open data mandates and taking what are nominally public records out of, out of uh, arrest records out of you know, paper files and wondering about you know, putting them online. And the uses of that data in, in that conversation were talked about. There's, you know, there's two kinds of uses. One, like, there are the there are the oceanographers and the and the and the uh, fishermen, right? That uh, the oceanographers the, yeah. do, you know, statistical analysis, but oceanographers yeah, part and part of the purpose fishermen. value of the data <laughs> is for like a journalist to to find a story that you know draws attention to some. Uh, you know, some, something that's going wrong in the system. And, and I would, uh, um, and I'd point to different, uh, both different levels of units of analysis where someone is inherently interested in the individual versus the population unit of analysis, the oceanographer versus the fisherman. Different, uh, different modes of analysis, which are easier, like are they, are they using uh, the modes of statistical computation and data transformation? Do they need to do record linkage? Do they need to run, Bayesian statistics on it, they, 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 to do cleaning on it. Those are different. You could think of those as computation versus different, uh, different overall goals for the use. Um, official decision communication. We collect a large survey so we can set the unemployment rate. So we can calculate that. That's what, what, what the, the budget, pays, budget line pays for and all of this. And so that's 
the big direct purpose. A lot of people, there's a much broader social benefit that is not accounted for in the same way. We have traces of that through research papers, et cetera, and business use. And then there's also a, an implied uh, requirement that things the government do should be accountable, transparent in some way. And that's, those, are, those are also, that's a separate dimension from whether it's individual or, or population level. That's, those are the distinctions I was trying to make. Thank you for that population individual level distinction. Which, um, and as a, this is an unindicted co-conspirator. Co <laughs>